one of the most important things about about a software company is you have to understand um, computer architecture. And one of the most important things about computer architecture is you can only afford one. Mm. Just as just as um, uh, some of the largest companies in the world only have two operating systems, you know, the single largest company on the planet only has two. How is it possible that 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 um, uh, you know so many companies have so many different computer architectures and they have uh, seven or eight or nine instruction sets that they're keeping around? We have one instruction set. We have one computer architecture, and we're super disciplined about that. And so where we need to be focused, we are. Where we uh, allow for, for um, uh, innovation and discovery uh, at the senior level, uh, we allow that. And so, so I think the company is tapered uh, and organized in a way that is consistent with the nature of our work. You know, so that's the most important thing. And, and that's probably the, the takeaway for, for what I've learned um, uh, building our company is there is no one generic architecture for every company. It should, it should fit. Uh, the function of the company, its purpose, and then of course the leadership style of the of the leaders. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really important um, note that most people don't really realize is that a company should almost be a bespoke structure supporting the CEO and their staff and the way the company, what the company is delivering to customers versus it's always the same thing. And I exactly. think that gets lost a lot. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's some particular um, chief this that you need and achieve that that you need mm-hmm. and achieve this that you know there's some chiefs that you do need yeah and um, but aside from that uh, you should start from first principles and architect something that that makes sense for the for the the leader and as well as the the, uh, yeah. the function yeah 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 when I, when I was at Google they had the famous 80 20 10 mm. where it was like 80 percent is core 20 percent is like core adjacent slash new stuff and then 10 percent was hyper experimental mm. Do you have any frameworks or ways to think about that stuff, or it's just kind of like let's see what organically is used in terms of this generic platform that we built with CUDA and other things that are, you know, built in to help support a lot of use cases? And as they emerge, we we say, okay, let's go support that new thing. Our st- yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I don't have any wise framework like that. Um, uh, there, there, there are a couple of things that that our company is shaped um, and structured to do. There's one part, uh, a very large part of our company is designed to. Uh, build very very complicated computers perfectly, mm. and so that's that is um, uh, one of its missions. Okay, and and uh, that kind of architecture, that kind of organization, uh, is a is a um, uh, invention and refinement organization. And then we have we have um, uh, a a whole bunch of of um, uh, skunk works, if you will. And the reason for that is because we're trying to invent things 10 years out that we're not exactly sure whether it's going to work or not. And, and there's a lot of adaptation, a lot of pivoting. And, um, and so, so, you know, our company actually has, has two different ways of working. One of them is rather organic, shape shifting all the time. If a particular investment's not working out, we give up on it, move the resources somewhere else. And so that's the agile part of the company. And then there's a part of the company that's not rigid. But it's really refined, mm-hmm. and so these two these two systems have to work side by side. Can you talk a little bit about the H one hundred next workhorse and like what um, what the most important innovations are and like what the like design and ship process for that looks like? I would say the the big breakthrough for Hopper is uh, recognizing that quantization, the numerical quantization, the numerical formats um, has has a fair amount of uh, innovation and uh, 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 ability to to reduce uh, because it's, it's statistical in the first place. And now the question is, what kind of models could be created and trained? And and um, uh, we believe that eight bit floating point, uh, it, rather than if you look at scientific computing today, sixty four bit floating point. And so just by breaking up sixty four into eight. You could increase the performance of an AI supercomputer just by a factor of eight by not doing 64-bit. And so, so that's, that's almost a factor of, if you will, a factor of 10 almost in, in just a couple of generations just by recognizing that 64-bit flowing point wasn't necessary. Mm-hmm. And so the, one of the big things is that. The second thing is, is Transformer. The Transformer engine is so universal and so useful that it's possible for us to design a um, pipeline that is shaped for uh, learning and, and uh, inferencing transformers. And so those are probably the two biggest things. Otherwise, 
it's the largest chip the world's ever made. It's, you know, the fastest chip the world's ever made and, you know, super energy efficient and uses the fast memory. I got to, to interrupt with a really funny story that happened recently. McDonald's in China. If you order a McFlurry, they ask you if you want a NVIDIA keychain with it, and it only sells for $20. But the problem is, they only made that available to less than 10,000 customers. So their NVIDIA keychain is already sold out, and it's right now in the retail market and sells for hundreds of dollars. And Elon commented on this, and he said that he had no idea that this was happening, and added, in that case, I will definitely have some just for you to know. The first link in description. Click on it if you want to buy this NVIDIA keychain. I don't know if this is a collaboration, but NVIDIA in China has posted about this, and also McDonald's in China posted about it. But anyways, in the next couple of years, this product might even sell for thousands of dollars. We don't get that many chances to buy rare collectibles like this. Anyways, find the link at the description and hurry, because we have just 100 pieces left. Memories of the world's ever made, and then we connect a whole bunch of these things together so that it's, it's fast and energy efficient. But those are all, you know, kind of brute forcey things. But the the, the big architecture idea is uh, FP8 and, and Transformer Engine. And when you think about then, so that's the, you know, big project refinement part mm -hmm. of the company. We think about the more agile piece, like what's the impossible application you're working on to get today that's 10 years out you think is likely to be important. I'm the sure there's a ton of them. But. There, there, there's a whole bunch we're working on that, that don't work at the moment, <laughs> um, but, but I've got a lot of confidence it will work. Okay, so for example, uh, uh, you know, autonomous driving is still uh, making progress, uh, but I have every confidence that it will work. Um, uh, I have every confidence that a robotic foundation model will be discovered and that, that um, uh, through, through uh, expressing yourself uh, using human language, um, uh, you could, you could uh, cause a, um, a megatronic system of almost different types of limbs and you know, agility to be able to uh, figure out how to bend itself, articulate itself uh, to do a particular task. And what do you and, think the um, blockers are to that today? Uh, I have no idea. Uh, I have no idea. Uh, but I, I can't tell you. I'm just, <laughs> I don't know. I don't <laughs> yeah. know. Yeah, because we have to discover our way there. Um, but one of the things that we do know is that we do know how to learn um, from uh, structured, inf learn structure from unstructured information. Uh, language, uh, images, and of course, the next big thing is video. Mm -hmm. And if we could just watch video and learn the structure from the video we're watching, uh, we might be able to learn how we articulate and we might be able to generalize that and be the articulation system for robots. Uh, so you were working on this huge set of applications before the you know current rate wave of artificial intelligence. What was the original... Um, technical advantage of NVIDIA in, in artificial intelligence and when did you begin to realize that um, this was going to be an important use case for you guys? Uh, so we, we had, we had um, uh, expanded the, the flexibility of our, of our, um, of our accelerators to, to be more general purpose. And we invented a, a new computing model uh, called CUDA. And um, we're doing those podcasts like at four o'clock or something like that in the afternoon. It was like at the lowest point of energy. Isn't that right? Yeah. So we wanted to, we wanted to make our, our, um, our graphics processors more and more general. And the reason for that in the beginning was because some of the effects that we had to do related to general purpose image processing, post effects, you render an image and you do post, post um, image effects. Um, other applications, of course, we wanted to bring the scene to life, and so we had to do physics processing. And you have to do physics, you have to do particle physics, fluid mm -hmm. dynamics, so on and so forth. And so we, we expanded the aperture of our, of our accelerated computing platform to be more and more and more general purpose. The problem with general purposeness is that the more general purpose you are, the less um, acceleration you get in any particular domain. And so you've you got to find that 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 line really, really carefully. And that's one of the gifts of our company to find that line 
between, on the one hand, every single generation bringing enormous amounts of acceleration well beyond what CPU could do um, to the application. And so if you become too general purpose, you're like just like a CPU. How can you accelerate a CPU with a CPU? And so you, so you have to find a way to f- walk that line. On the other hand, if you don't expand the aperture of the applications that you serve, the R&D dollars that you're able to generate wouldn't be enough to stay ahead of the CPU, which had the largest R&D budget of any chip on the planet. So if you think about this problem, it's actually really nearly impossible because you have a small application, let's call it you know a billion dollar market at the time, and, and out of that billion dollar market, you're investing $150, $150 million a year. Out of that $150 million a year, how do you keep up with a few hundred billion dollar industry? It's not even sensible. And so you have to find that niche very, very carefully where $150 million would accelerate this particular application abnormally and insanely. And then over time, you could expand your application space so that it goes from a billion dollars to $5 billion to $10 billion, so on and so forth, without falling off that cliff. That is the fine line that we work, we walk. And, and so we kept expanding the, the general purposeness, and it led us to uh, molecular dynamic simulation, which is what this image seems to look like. And, and um, uh, seismic processing was another uh, industry. And uh, just slowly by surely, uh, we, we expanded our aperture. But one of the things that we did well was to make sure that, that irrespective of whether somebody used our platform for general purpose computing, accelerated computing, we always maintain the architecture compatibility. And the reason for that is because we wanted uh, a platform that would attract developers. If every single NVIDIA chip in the world was incompatible, then how would a developer be able to pick one up, even if they learned that, that CUDA was going to be incredible for them? How would they pick that up and say, I'm going to develop an application that's going to run on that? Which chip would they, would they have to go figure out? And, and nobody could figure that out. And so we said... If we're going to, if we believe in an architecture and if we want this to be a new computing platform, then let's make sure that every one of our chips uh, perform exactly the same way, just like an x86, just like ARM, just like any computing platform. And so for the first five, 10 years, you know, we had very few customers for CUDA, but we made every chip CUDA compatible. And you can go back in history and looked at, looked at our gross margins. Um, it started out, it started out poor and it got worse. You know, so yeah, because we were we were in a really competitive industry and and we were still trying to figure out how to do our job and build cost effective things. So so, you know, it, it was already challenging as it is. And then we layered on top of this, this architecture that was called CUDA that had no applications that nobody paid for. Yeah. It's and kind so, of amazing because now when I talk to people in the AI world in terms of one of the reasons that they really love using NVIDIA GPUs is because of CUDA mm-hmm. and then because of the ability to scale interconnect. Yeah. And so you can really like highly parallelize these things as well, which you can't necessarily do with other approaches or architectures that are in the market today. Yeah, and so this this computing platform, it it's a uh, it's strange in the sense that it does it performs these miraculous things, um, and and uh, we carried it to to the world on the backs of GeForce, which is a mm-hmm. gaming card, mm-hmm. uh, the, the first GPU that Jeff Hinton got for his lab. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Ela will tell you that that uh, Jeff came in and said, "Here's a couple of uh, uh, GPUs. Mm-hmm. It's called GeForce, and uh, you, you guys should try to use that for for um, yeah. uh, for uh, DNN." Andrew Ang uh, reached out to Bill Daly, our our chief scientist, um, to uh, work on a way to get the neural network model that they were working mm-hmm. on uh, onto GPU, so that they could, instead of using uh, thousands of uh, CPU servers, mm-hmm. they could use a few GPUs. Uh, to uh, to do training, so that was one. Simultaneously, almost uh, simultaneously, uh, Jeff Hinton reached out to us, and mm-hmm. we started hearing about that. And uh, same thing was happening with Jan LeCun in his lab, and mm-hmm. and so simultaneously in several different labs, we're starting to feel that there's this this uh, this neural network mm-hmm. you know, emergence that that is, and and that attracted our attention. Yeah, I guess 2012 was also the year when AlexNet came out. So it yeah, felt right. like that was a year of transition for deep learning in general in terms of really, that was the moment in time at least that I remember thinking, wow, this this really exciting wave of AI coming. Yeah. And then I feel like for 10 years, nothing really happened for startups, but a lot of incumbents started adopting this technology. Yeah, scale. we started feeling yeah. it. We started hearing about it before that. And then ImageNet kind of, it, mm-hmm. was, it was the big bang, if you will, got all of our attention. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I got to, to interrupt with a really funny story that happened recently. 
McDonald's in China. If you order a McFlurry, they ask you if you want a NVIDIA keychain with it, and it only sells for $20. But the problem is, they only made that available to less than 10,000 customers. So their NVIDIA keychain is already sold out, and it's right now in the retail market and sells for hundreds of dollars. And Elon commented on this, and he said that he had no idea that this was happening, and added, in that case, I will definitely have some just for you to know. The first link in description. Click on it if you want to buy this NVIDIA keychain. I don't know if this is a collaboration, but NVIDIA in China has posted about this, and also McDonald's in China posted about it. But anyways, in the next couple of years, this product might even sell for thousands of dollars. We don't get that many chances to buy rare collectibles like this. Anyways, find the link at the description and hurry, because we have just 100 pieces left.